Hello there, welcome to this new episode and today we'll talk about Bible and tradition. When the Lord Jesus or the Apostles mentioned about the sacred writings, obviously they were referring to those books of the Old Testament, especially the Pentateuch or the first five books, the Psalms or the Prophets. It is only after the death of the last Apostle that the Church guided by the Holy Spirit has discerned which books form part of the whole canon of the sacred scriptures. Since the earliest times after the generation of the Apostles, the particular churches founded by the Apostles themselves as they gather every Sunday to celebrate the mystery of Christ's resurrection, they would read the announcements of the prophets in the Old Testament, they would sing psalms and listen to the memories written by the Apostles. There was no Christian Bible as we know it today, but there were only sacred texts from the Israelite people still expectant of the coming of the Messiah. There were also those texts written by the Apostles or Apostolic men, especially the Gospels, which in the earliest times were already known to be four and nothing more, that of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The letters of St. Paul were already esteemed and treated with great regard, even for those who are not the direct recipients. As early as the second letter of Peter, the existence of those Poland letters is already testified. Domini nostri longa nemitatem, salutem arbitramini, sicut carissimus frater noster, Paulus, secundum datam sibi sapientiam scripsit vobis. During the first community of Christians, still in the company of the apostles themselves, when there was still, still no Bible as we have it today, the entire people, united with their shepherds, remained always steadfast in the teaching of the apostles, in the common life, in the breaking of the bread, and in prayers. Erant autem perseverantes in doctrina apostolorum et communicatione, in fractione panis et orationibus. During the initial years of Christianity, there was no pressing need among the followers of Christ to know exactly and exclusively what books are considered sacred scripture. Though unanimous as to what Old Testament books and apostolic writings are to be read in their celebrations, the canon of the scripture as we know it today was still fluid. This was not the case when the Gnostics and other heretics started to create their own canons. Sometimes they themselves would write books and name them after the apostles. That is the case of Gnostic Gospels and other apocryphal writings bearing the names of any of the twelve apostles or other apostolic men. Bishops of particular churches or gathering of bishops in particular councils have responded by enumerating the names of sacred books which are venerated by Christians all over, are read in liturgical assembly and form part of those collection of sacred writings which are normative for the church. But it was not until the Council of Trent in the 16th century in the face of the errors of Protestantism, that all the bishops in union with the Pope solemnly declared the list of books in the Bible, as mentioned already by particular fathers of the Church, as well as other particular councils in the early centuries of Christianity. From our present-day perspective, knowing the Bible as a complete and closed canon of sacred books, there is that temptation, including among those who are fervent Christians, of looking at it as if it is a book that came down from heaven, written by God Himself, in which every single word is of divine origin and impeccable. The Bible is written by ordinary men like us, but not in an ordinary way, because the human writers 
wrote those books under the influence of the Holy Spirit. God inspired the sacred writers who at the same time had their freedom intact and non-violated. In every book of the Bible, there are two wills perfectly coinciding. One is that of the human author with all its limitations and imperfections, and the other is that of God who is omnipotent, all-knowing, and eternal. The Bible is like the church's record book of God's revelation about himself and his plan of salvation. Strictly speaking, it is not God's revelation per se, but the record of God's revelation as written by men inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that between the thing revealed and its putting into record, it would be guaranteed by God's unfailing grace. Nonetheless, there are elements of God's revelation which are not put into writing, but are transmitted orally or by institutions of the apostles, as St. Paul already mentioned. Itaque fratres, estate tenere tradiciones, quas dirigistis, sive per sermone, sive per epistolam nostram. The letter of St. Jude also mentions the faith, our common salvation, handed down once and for all, about which he feels the need to put into writing. This implies, in the first place, that the contents of our faith is a tradition, such that the Bible may be considered as a tradition put into writing. Carissimi, Omnem solicitudinem facen scribendi vobis de comuni nostra salute. Necesse abue scrivere vobis deprecans certare pro semel tradita sanctis fide. Together with the Bible as the written record, the unwritten tradition also forms part of those realities of God's revelation handed down to us an action likewise assisted by the Holy Spirit. Both the written and the unwritten record form one single deposit entrusted to the Church and from which she takes her certainty on the things that are divinely revealed. This deposit of faith is kept by the Church and is interpreted by the legitimate teaching authority the Magisterium, with the same assistance of the Holy Spirit. To sum it up, we say that God revealed Himself and His plan of salvation, that of making us partakers in His divine and blessed life. This divine revelation took place in history and had its fullness and perfection in the coming of Christ, the Son of God. This revelation is captured and transmitted, so to say, both in the written record done by men under the influence of the Holy Spirit, which we call the Holy Bible, and also through the unwritten record and practice, which is the apostolic tradition, the living tradition, whose transmission through the ages is likewise under the guidance and assistance of the Holy Spirit. Both the Bible and the living tradition form one sacred deposit, the deposit of faith, in which the teaching authority of the Church, the living magisterium, likewise assisted by the Holy Spirit, takes its certainty in teaching the people of God on things which are divinely revealed. Thank you very much for watching this video, and for our next episode we will talk about the Magisterium of the Church.